I now recognize Ms. Lesko from Arizona for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I want to thank you for having uh, this topic of discussion. I think it's an important topic. Um, and I also want to thank all four of you for coming to testify today in front of us. And I have to admit that I know Dr. Singer for, I don't know, like 20 years, I think, 20 years. He's from Arizona. And I represent uh, a Phoenix area and some suburbs of, of Phoenix in the Arizona. Um, I would love to debate um, some of the extreme uh, pro-abortion views that are going on in our country right now that support abortion up to the very last minute, but this is not the meeting to do that at. So next time I will debate that if we have a hearing on that. Um, Dr. Singer, on April 2nd, 2020, Arizona Governor Doug Ducey issued an executive order barring pharmacists from dispensing hydrochloroquine or ivermectin unless they had a prescription from a doctor saying the patient had COVID-19. In Arizona, patients were not allowed to use these drugs for preventative measures, even if a doctor prescribed it. The governor limited the prescription to 14 days. Uh, this was the case not just in Arizona, but across the country. Now, I'm not sure in the case of Arizona um, if I think he did it, quite frankly, because he thought there would be a shortage of ivermectin and hydrochloroquine. Also, in 2021, William and Carla Salier had gotten prescriptions from a doctor in Missouri for ivermectin and hydrochloroquine to treat their infection with COVID-19. William Salier had become seriously ill from the virus. Pharmacists at Walmart and Hy-Vee refused to fill those prescriptions. Carla Salier says the Walmart pharmacist rudely lectured her about the dangers of treating COVID-19 with ivermectin, and the Hy-Vee pharmacist said it was against corporate policy to prescribe the drugs for COVID-19. Dr. Singer, do you think it was right for governments and pharmacies to overrule doctors? Uh, thank you, Representative Lesko. As, as I said in my opening statement, um, this was a, a, a major problem. Um, and nowadays, uh, most pharmacies employ pharmacists and most uh, medical doctors are employed either by hospitals or by corporate clinics who, uh, even if they're not explicitly told mm. by government agencies what the policy should be, they, they certainly get, feel the pressure and they don't want to go against government agencies. Uh, right now, the evidence suggests that hydro hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin are not helpful in the treatment of, uh, of COVID-19. But in the early days of this pandemic, when thousands were dying on, on a daily basis, and that we didn't know, the information was just coming in. We're still getting information. We're still learning more now than we thought we, we knew. Um, and um, there was anecdotal and observational evidence that these drugs may be effective to prevent or treat COVID-19. It was, a, I would argue, the ethical thing for a physician speaking to, to their patient to say, I, I'm, a, I'm aware from anecdotal evidence that this may be helpful. We're talking about drugs that have very safe, uh, a, a very good safety profile. They've been around for years, used for other things, and don't have a, a very high complication rate. And I, I think it would have been unethical for the physician not to mention to the patient that this may be helpful, providing you understand that it, I can't guarantee it because the, all the information isn't in, and providing that you're willing to accept whatever risks this drug has, and then let the patient decide. So this became politicized, and this is kind of unprecedented because, as it was mentioned earlier during the testimony, we. 20% or more of all the drugs prescribed in this country are, are off-label pres prescriptions, mm -hmm. and we don't see this kind of interference. And we physicians, as, as we learn as time goes by, if, if we learn that the, the off-label use of that drug turns out not to be effective, then we stop doing it. But, but we won't, if, if we suppress uh, in basically clinical investigation and just sharing of clinical knowledge, then we, don't have, we suppress the advance of, of medical science. Well, I agree, and so thank you very much. And Dr. Williams, I, do you have anything more to say on the subject? Because I know Dr. Miller Meeks ran out of time. Well, my colleague, uh, thank you. Uh, 
she made a good point. As a as a pediatric subspecialist, as a child neurologist, I've I've had to use drugs off label for my pediatric patients, for example, my entire career. I mean, we did it every single day of fellowship, for example. So I was used to having that conversation with my patient about off label use, risk, benefit, uh, and and we make a decision. The patient makes a decision in consultation with their medical care provider, whether it's a physician, nurse practitioner, PA, et cetera. So that's part of that sacred relationship that we're here talking about today. And also, I would ask everyone to keep in mind that early on, hydroxychloroquine had an EUA briefly for use. All right. Well, thank you all again. And I ran out of time, so I yield back.